Hello and welcome, everybody. Um, the session we're about to start is Technology Has a Diversity Problem. There's no question mark in that title because the numbers are stark. The latest research suggests that women make up just 26% of the entire computing profession. And that figure is much lower when it comes to senior management. The figures for ethnic minorities are much lower. My name is Jane Martinson, and I write for The Guardian. But more importantly, here to discuss this issue with me is Susan Herman, president of the American Civil Liberties Union, and Blake Irvin, who's the CEO of GoDaddy and has spent more than 30 years in the technology industry. I thought we'd start off, Susan and Blake, by talking about your definition of diversity. What exactly is it, and how important is it as an issue for the industry? For, for, for my company, and I think for the industry generally, you're building products for a, a, the globe, which is incredibly diverse by nature. So what you're trying to do in a company is to create a workforce that looks as much like your customer base as possible. And for us, we have 17 million customers that are tiny businesses, little solopreneurs from all walks of life, all races and religions, all countries, really every country on the planet, male and female with different sexual uh, orientation, et cetera. You're trying to create an organization that can build products and market products to those individuals and yet actually have to understand them incredibly well. The best way to do that is actually have a modeled workforce that looks exactly like your customer base. To us, that's what diversity is. Right. And and how important is it in terms of the business oh. going forward? Oh, it's incredibly important. So it, it's not that if you had a team that was all men that they're going to exclude uh, women on purpose. But what ends up happening is because you have a bunch of folks that are you know, just like each other, that are, that are building products for folks that are kind of like each other because that's the perspective they have. And there's great examples. One that was tech back in the Detroit, early days in Detroit where uh, airbags, when they were first built, were built by engineers that were all men. So when those first airbags were actually pushed into vehicles and were finally starting to deploy in accidents, they found that it started to kill women and started to kill children. Yeah. Why? Because they didn't build airbags for women and children because they never thought about it because they were all men on the engineering team. There are lots of examples of that very thing happening. And that's a life and death situation, yeah. so it's much more grave than you know, some of the software that we do today. Okay. Susan, how about you? What does diversity actually mean to you? Well, I think what diversity actually means is it has to mean more than numerical diversity. Because at this point, what Blake is saying, I think, has been realized by a lot of companies that it's actually good for business if they have a diversified workforce and people with different perspectives and different backgrounds, whether it's women and men, whether it's racial minorities or LGBT people or people with disabilities, that the more perspective you get, the better you do. But I think what we've also learned is that if you just try to you know, box check and you have re respectable reporting, we have X percent of this and five of those and three of these, <laughs> that's not going to work. And if you think you're making a good faith effort at diversifying, you have to pay attention not just to the numbers, but to whether you have functional diversity. And to have that, you have to have equity. You have to have people comfortable that they're being treated fairly and that women or minorities are being paid according to the same pay scale as men, evaluated fairly, treated with respect. So that's equity, just equal treatment. And also inclusion. Because as Blake was just saying, if you have a kind of a dominant culture and everybody thinks, you know, oh, oh this is just locker room talk, anyone understands that. Yeah. Yeah, maybe they don't get that the women don't see the locker room talk and the descriptions of their anatomy as being quite as you know, welcoming as the men do. So you really, the two parts is you know, the very important, but it's more than just the numbers. It, you really have to think yeah. hard if you're meaning to diversify about whether you're going to be able to not only attract, but keep the people you have and keep them feeling respected. I want to go on about, to talk about what we can do about it, what each of us, whether employer, CEO, employee, can actually do to make it better. But could we first sort of, what, what are the worst consequences of this sort of lack of diversity or inclusiveness? Um, you know, is it a business failure or is it much worse, a sort of cultural disconnect? What's the sort of almost the Armageddon scenario if we carry on not taking this seriously? Well, to me, number one Armageddon is what we're seeing lately, which is downright sexual abuse and sexual harassment. 
where if there's something about a culture, a dominant culture, that doesn't really tend to see the point of view of, say, women, not that women are the only people who are ever harassed or victimized, but you know, they are most of the people who experience that. So I think that a lot of people in business will say, well, you know, I'm not acting like Harvey Weinstein and therefore I have no problem. You know, we know you're not supposed to be a sexual predator. Well, you know, it's a real problem even if you have a Harvey Weinstein because for every you know, Bill O'Reilly or you know, all the other people we've yeah. seen in every field that feel entitled to you know, hit on women uh, in their employ and, and you know, all different levels, you know, from making them uncomfortable to rape, there's a whole culture of people around them who knew exactly what was going on and didn't report. Yeah. So the fact that you know, not only is this one bad apple in the company, but all these other people who were enablers, and then a whole other you know, level of people who were maybe unaware of right. what was happening and who need to learn more. Yeah. So to me, the fact that people don't understand each other is really kind of what's devastating. Can I, I'll tell you about a cartoon I once saw, which I think is very you know, wonderfully illustrative. There were two men and a woman in a workplace looking at each other, and each had a thought bubble. And the woman's thought bubble said, those men, they just don't get it. And one of the men who was black had a thought bubble that said, those white people, they just don't get it. And the other man was looking at the other two people and saying, those straight people, they just don't get it. <laughs> <laughs> so to me, you know, the fact that we don't know which is in each other's thought bubbles, even yeah. before you get to business and how that interacts on business, that's a terrible way to run a community when we just don't know, we don't understand each other's perspectives. Yeah. Right, right. Blake, what do you feel the worst consequences are? We, you've been in the business for 30 years. There's some evidence, and I know it's not just about the numbers, some evidence that actually diversity has got worse during the past well, 30 years. It, it has, actually, in computer science in particular. You know, if you went back to the 80s, women were much better represented in computer science than they are today. And if you think about what's happened over the last three decades, there's been sort of this programmer mentality of the guys who have been starting big businesses that have been successful in computer science mm. have been you know, you know, meat eating, slide a pizza under the door, you know, at 6 a.m., I'm gonna work till 12, and it's been glamorized in both movies, uh, in Hollywood, and it's been, you know, I think something that's been real, and it has not been uh, an inclusive culture. And I think, you know, honestly, I, I think if you're actually creating an inclusive culture from the top of the company and making sure there's focus at the CEO level, and then actually a ton of support at the grassroots level that says, look, we're gonna have a GoDaddy women in tech uh, organization. We're going to have a GoDaddy Blacks in Tech uh, organization, Hispanics in Tech organization, and these what we call importantly resource groups that allow people to get you know birds of the feather, get them together, and make sure that they feel like they have a voice that's stronger than the individual. Yeah. That that helps a lot. Uh, I do believe that companies haven't systematically started to build the processes and the measurements inside to actually measure the right thing. I think your point about, it's just not about numbers and show me, I got five of these and three of these and yeah. that kind of thing. It's, it's really about how do I make sure that, that women who don't speak up for promotion as often as a guy, and there's lots of evidence that a woman will be 80% qualified for a role and won't believe she's qualified for this next role, 80%. A guy is 35% qualified for a role, goes, you know, I I'll figure it out on the, on the you know, I'm, I'll get it, uh, you know, eventually, yeah. right? How do you actually make sure systematically that, that you're, you're creating systems that solve for that? And uh, at our company, we actually started doing something we call a forced promotion review. So for your first three years in the company, which is where people either start to get trajectory or don't, that we make sure that everyone in the company gets a review for promotion regardless of whether they're asking for it or whether they're, they're not. And what we found when we did that, based on just merits, Mm. that when you review women who aren't asking for it, we saw a 30% increase in promotion of women across the company without affecting the number of men that were being promoted. Right. And, and I think those kind of systems are what have to be put in place to solve some of the systematic issue that exists uh, in the Valley. And it goes from my company and company to company. That, that also feeds into this idea, and many people in the audience will want to know, well, this is all great and it sounds good, but. Is it good for business? Are you doing, when you started at GoDaddy, the, the ads that they ran with those scantily clad women, it said everything that you didn't want to know about the tech industry. And you changed that, and you brought in these practices to do with how women worked at your organization. Did you do that because it was good for business or just because it was good for PR? No, so this, like, just a couple of facts. 58% of small businesses in the United States, as an example, are run by women. 
So you probably ought not to alienate them with your advertising. So we flipped the advertising to show women as entrepreneurs, fighting the good fight, working a small business, whether it was cutting flowers, washing windows, whatever it was, mm -hmm. and really t trying to be somebody who's successful, whatever successful means in their eyes, yeah. versus saying, look, we're going to attract a lot of people. Now, I'll tell you, Bob, and it's a sad thing about the world, got 80% brand recognition based on those commercials he ran, because he, and he's a very good marketer, knows what people are thinking, and in spite of how, I think, objective objectifying those ads were, they sold product and they actually moved market share for the company. Now, you don't have to shock people and like create that kind of, uh, that kind of, oh my God, feeling when somebody's watching the ads if you have 80% brand awareness. Yeah. So for us, it was you know, a really opportune time for us to say, let's show people what we do, who we do it for, show women as strong entrepreneurs, because they are, and then let's go ahead and make sure the language and the way that we're treating women inside the company so we don't have a leaky bucket problem, which happens a lot right. in the business, right. where yeah. you're acquiring new, new employees and about 50% of our new college graduate computer scientists are women now, but you want to retain them and create an environment that is supported by how you look externally and how you act internally uh, and make sure both of those things align on, on really creating a strong environment that supports mm -hmm. women. Right. So those are the positive reasons to, you know, that it is good for business and a wise thing to do. There are also negative reasons, which, for example, now with the Me Too movement, with so many women in particular beginning to rise up and you know, telling their stories, I think what you don't want to do is to wait to be sued or have a public relations disaster. Yeah. So you know, the negative reason to be paying attention to all this is you don't want to become a legal problem or a public relations problem. You want to get right. out ahead of it. Yeah. And that, I mean, there's so much about the culture, Susan. You know, we've talked about this sort of culture of harassment where things are accepted, and uh, not just women, but uh, minorities, anybody who feels other than the sort of dominant group can feel very excluded and un unable to speak out. What would you say, has, has that, are there, are there sort of moves in place that that's getting better, that technology is in allowing us to speak out? Me too, you mentioned, right. but there are many more. I think there are a few ways in which I, you know, I would like to talk to the people, not only the managers like Blake, who can make a tremendous difference in providing more, you know, a better culture, better training about you know, what sexual harassment is, uh, clear channels for reporting sexual harassment, transparency, right. uh, yeah, an audit of what your evaluations process are. There are all sorts of things you can do from the top. If you're not at the top and you don't have control over what the company does, I think there are nevertheless a lot of things that you can do. And I think that if you are, let's say, the man in that situation, and you're just not sure, you know, is what you're saying going to come across as locker room talk? Yeah, we had a saying in the 60s, if you're not part of the solution, you're part of the problem. Yeah. And I think everybody has to assume that they're part of the problem if they're not part of the solution. Yeah. So you know, find out, you know, ask somebody, if I say this, how does that make you feel? Right? And just you know, find out from your colleagues whether you're being somebody who's exclusive. What I would say to the women is if you feel that you're suffering you know, some sort of harassment or you know, some treatment that really makes you feel not welcome and not equal, don't just suffer in silence. Don't just leave for another company. Find allies. If you can't find allies in the workplace, find them something else. And what you, what you were saying, Jane, I think is very valuable in terms of, in, if anything, the tech world should be able to figure this out. Yeah. So that, you know, there are hacks for this. Um, yeah. what, there's this company called Callisto, which is used a lot on campus, which has a confidential reporting system for um, harassment and sexual abuse. And one of the options is if you log in and you report that something's happened to you and you target a certain person who's done something, you will have the option of have that, having that not be reported unless somebody else makes a similar report. Okay. So there's that kind of thing. We're also working with, um, the ACLU is working with Facebook on whether or not their um, application apps, you know, the affinity apps, are steering job ads to women or you know, not to women right. or not to, not to minorities. So I think there are a lot of things that can be done with tech to try to solve the problem of having yeah. more transparency and just more pushback. Yeah. Do you think that this year, I mean, that not only has diversity sort of become an issue and the idea that the stereotype of the most successful people over the past 30 years have all been men from a certain socioeconomic group, but there's also been a backlash this year. I mean, the, the Google, um, James Demore, who wrote the 10-page document and got a huge amount of criticism, lost his job, but then there was an enormous backlash online where people said, he's right, you know, they, you don't need emotional qualities that women all have. Do you sense that backlash, particularly in America, 
is quite dangerous, or do do you not think? Do you think that was sort of a, a, a one-off flash? You know, it, it, uh, if you if you think about it as an inclusion problem, and not so much a G, uh, you're you're going to spend more time supporting women than you're supporting men. Um, I think men, when that starts to happen, and when when all when when James was was fired, there were quite a few guys who were saying. Hey man, well, what about us? What yeah. about us? Because they weren't feeling included in the conversation, and here was somebody who actually spoke out and was fired for it. Well, I, I, I disagree with f firing James for, for that particular rant. Uh, I think it would have been a great time for people to actually have a conversation with them and actually mm -hmm. discuss it. I mean, that happens not just to Google; it happens to a lot of companies. And and I think that the the backlash is more about inclusion. Right. And. and you know, if you, we're talking about trying to make an inclusive environment for everybody, which includes men as well. And like, I think w women, at the, the numbers that you talked about, 26%, that's real stuff. Mm. It's not, and it's getting better, but it's, you know, a multi-decade problem to get it up to where we think it's parity yeah. and equity. Uh, yeah. So. Um, I think we could talk about so much more, but with time is pressing on. So I just want you to leave the audience with your one thought, one piece of advice. You know, going out there today, there are lots of other things going on at the Web Summit. What can you do about the issue of diversity in technology? Uh, well, I think I'm going to quote our Department of Homeland Security. One thing you can do is if you see something, say something. You know, don't be the bystander, don't be the enabler. And particularly if you are somebody who you don't think is a predator, you know, or, you know, make sure that you're responsible for the environment around you by finding out. I think you know, the, the idea too, I think part of that too is um, making sure that there is training so people can learn things that they don't know. You know. Women end up being paid less because of the fact that people look at their previous salary and their previous salary was lower. So, okay, right. so yeah. once you figure that out, you can do something about it. Brilliant, thank you. You know, uh, the, the, I think one piece of advice um, that, that I would give would be, it, it's not a woman's problem. I mean, this is, we, we can yeah. talk about race and like there's a, there's a lot of problems in diversity in tech. Let's just take, you know, the, the place where we have 50-50 around the globe. Uh, guys, it's a guy problem. Like, it's when you have, you know, 75% of the workforce, you are responsible for creating an environment of inclusion, for building systems that make people feel included and make sure that equity is something that progresses in the right direction. And I think, you know, guys will say, it's, it, it's a women's problem. It's not. It's all our problem because products get better, companies get better, society moves forward when there's inclusivity. And I, I, just, I just would Brilliant. leave with that. So it's everybody's problem. We can all do something about it. Yes. If you're not part of the solution, you are part, part of the problem. Of the problem. <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jane. Everybody, Susan Herman, Blake Irvin. Thank you, Blake. Thanks, Thanks Susan. <laughs>